Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Andrew with iTeach. And once again, we're here at uh, 10 a.m. to join a teacher or administrator to talk about the teaching profession. So it's my honor and privilege to speak to Matthew Goodson this morning. How are you doing, Matt? Good, very good. Thanks for asking. Uh, so I got a lot of questions for you. Uh, I know the, kind of the topic of the day is, is kind of special ed, and we'll, we'll certainly dive into your experiences in special ed. I want to hear all about that. But to begin with, I'd just like to start the conversations with learning a little bit about you and how you got into teaching. Yeah, well, um, I went to a uh, Texas A&M Commerce. I started out as a criminal justice major. And, you know, the last thing they have you do is to go ahead and do your ride-alongs. And, you know, I think one of my professors explained uh, criminal justice properly. He said, you know, police officer, being a police officer is 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror because <laughs> it was a lot of boredom driving around in those uh, police cars and just sitting around and hanging out and just, man, this, this is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life. And so I kind of changed my mind and I was like, you know, maybe I'll try to uh, get into education. And I uh, did the I Teach Texas thing. I didn't really have any luck finding a job at first. And so, uh, you know, I had to get some kind of income. So I started the, in the insurance world with a uh, data entry. I got kind of, kind of bored with that pretty rapidly, you know, when I was like, you know, I kind of want to do something to where I feel like I'm giving back. I'm doing something good. I'm doing something positive. So, um, you know, I, I, my, I teach Texas thing was still going on. So I was like, let me just, you know, re, uh, uh, apply to some jobs, see what happens. And I, I kind of lucked out and got a, interview because a teacher left uh last second and then i've been at mesquite for six years man that's kind of a whirlwind story to get to where you're yeah. at <laughs> right no joke <laughs> uh how, how long were you insurance once you enrolled in the program you went into another field for how long right. were you uh, um i was in insurance probably till i was uh, i would probably say about five five six years in insurance so i started teaching when i was about 28 yeah so you hopped in immediately right into special ed why why did you choose special ed tell me a little bit about the special ed attraction man i just you know we i was an athlete in high school when i kind of did the uh, special olympics and i kind of fell in love with you know working with the special needs population and that's kind of how i just ended up in special education all right so let's dive into that topic uh okay. set the set the scene for us what kind of students do you have currently and we'll kind of get to where you're okay. at but uh what's the age group and and what oh. kind of special ed do you have I teach, I'm having a classroom right now with nine kids and they go from ages from uh, first grade all the way up to fourth grade. So okay. I have kids with autism, intellectual disability, uh, wheelchair bound. I have nonverbal verbal students. So I, I teach a wide range. Man, that that's, uh, it sounds really challenging, but, but it also, I guess can be rewarding, right? Oh yeah, of course. It's, you know, I, I get to go to work every day. There's challenges every day, but you know, on the drive home, at least I can say, Hey, you know, I'm doing something good. I'm doing something positive. At least I'm giving, I'm giving back and I, I enjoy what I'm doing. So tell me a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, your first year hopping into special ed. Uh, you, you didn't have a background in teaching. You hop right into a special ed classroom <laughs> and tell me what that was like. I mean, my first year was, it, I, I was lucky at the, to be my first year because in my first year I only had three students and they were all sixth graders. My first year was in an autistic unit in Mesquite they call it total language classroom. So they're all high, they were higher functioning autistic boys. And so my first year I was so stressed, my you know, teaching all the art paperwork, learning the ins and outs of special education. But looking back, I was like, man, that should have been the easiest year of my teaching career, but because it was my first year, I was just stressed out. But it was a good learning experience. And then uh after that year, uh, the, uh, in the skeet, they call it like learning in a functional environment or life skills. And so that we had that classroom on campus too. That teacher left and they asked me if I wanted to move over and try that one out. And cause I knew most of the students cause we interacted together. And sure, so I moved sure. over there and I think I found my passion with the, the, the life skills classroom. I really enjoy what I'm doing in there. Is, are you still in life skills or how long? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've been in there for five years. So it's six years total mesquite first year in the autistic uh, unit and this year and we're five years in the uh, life skills classroom. So you mentioned a, a word that I'm not sure a lot of our viewers might know, but you mentioned your first year you, you had some ARDS to do. What, oh, what's an ARD? yeah. Tell us what an ARD is. Oh, annual review and dismissal. Oh my goodness. Every, every special education teacher favorite thing to do. It's just <laughs> mounds and mounds and mounds of paperwork and typing and, 
and the present level of academic, you know, achievement. And oh my goodness, it's it's fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> oftentimes, uh, you know, special ed. If someone knows special ed, or they're an inclusion teacher. There's a lot of great things about inclusion special ed. I mean, there's right. a lot of great things about teaching in general, especially in special ed. But what they don't realize is that special ed is unique in the amount of paperwork and documentation you have to do for all the different filings and accountabilities uh, surrounding right. the students. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, we went, people were thinking, like, how are you working more at home now? You don't have the kids. Well, you know, our level of documentation jumped up to where now, you know, you know, we were documenting a lot, but now it's times 10 of everything we're having to document of all the letters we're sending, emails we're sending to the parents, you know, we're having to come up with plans to, you know, to teach these students in a whole different environment now. So our paperwork is now like sky high right now. So where does the paperwork go? Does it go to the district, state, teachers, parents? Where else does that go? Oh, everywhere. I mean, we have basically in Mesquite, we use um, what's called eSped. You know, we archive our, our paperwork into that system so it's saved. And then each student in Mesquite has a huge folder. I mean, it, the longer they've been at Mesquite, the bigger the folders are. So by the time some of these students get to high school, you're having to wheel in a cart full of wow. paperwork of every single R that they've had. And, you know, just with, for my students, an art on an art on the small end will be like sixty pages long, with all the supplements you have to fill out. You know, you have your personal care supplement, your transportation supplement. If they're autistic, you have an autism supplement. I mean, it can go. You get, some have behavior intervention plans. So each supplement, each plan adds more to the paperwork. So Matt, tell me, you, your first year teaching, we obviously at iTeach provide you a supervisor. Did you have any right. else uh, supporting you, mentor, teacher, anything like that at Mesquite? Um, yeah, well, the, the, my iTeach Texas mentor was great. She came to the classroom, we talked, she watched me, she gave me some, some pointers. But basically my mentor on my campus was my art advice chair. She was the inclusion teacher. So without her kind of pointing me in the right direction with the R paperwork and giving me the ins and outs of what needs to be done, I would be completely lost. I mean, that's the best advice I could give to any teacher, general ed, special education. Find you a mentor teacher on campus that you can lean on and ask questions and that can just be there for moral support. Yeah, I mean, mentor teachers are, are obviously, not obviously, they're clearly invaluable yeah, to, to the right. person teacher. So, so on, watching this and from their perspective they're thinking about getting into teaching you said a mentor teacher is invaluable can you not to pop quiz you but was there no. a time during your first year that a mentor teacher kind of came into a situation and really helped like what's an example of something a mentor teacher would do oh, the biggest thing for me was whenever you know being a special education teacher we have to write goals and objectives and for in my classroom, you have to write goals and objectives for every single core subject. And then typically you're going to have a daily living or a social skills goal as well. And so I really didn't know how to write goals and objectives. And so she basically just sat there and said, okay, you need to have, you know, you want to make have an overview here. Your objectives want to kind of fill in for this goal and objective to, to reach that mastery. So without her being there to assist me, my goals and objectives would have been horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's amazing just those small <clears throat> small little directions that a mentor teacher can give you yeah. to set the ship right from the beginning right exactly exactly every little bit helps because i mean it, for it, for to explain it to someone that's never set an art or looked at art paperwork there's a million boxes and one little box that's not checked can be the re can be the difference of a revision art or an amendment so you've got to go through that with a fine tooth comb <laughs> So you, you mentioned goals and, and obviously you have, <clears throat> excuse me, goals for the students that are documented uh, right. to achieve. Do you have any personal goals for each student or how do you think about like when you envision the year with your student right. population, mm -hmm. what goals do you have for them? For the uh, you know, whenever I'm thinking of writing a goal or objective for my student, I try mm -hmm. to think of what goal or objective will not only help them in the classroom, but will help them in, in life. You know, you have to think of an overview of what's going to, you know, so maybe focus on numbers, focus on addition. If you go down to the, to the teaks, to, the, to, to what you're looking at, there's a lot of social studies and science goals around daily routines, health and safety. So you can write goals and objectives around those to not only help them in your classroom, but to help them as they get older and throughout life. 
Yeah, I think it's really important to think more broadly than just the day or, or even the year. And it also speaks to the differentiation of, of delivery you had to have. You said you had nine students, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like they are widely varied in terms of academic um, you know, status. Right. How do you go about managing the differentiation just practically day to day about making sure each one is, is on track to hit that goal? Yeah. Well, luckily, um, I have two uh, paraprofessionals in my classroom with me. Without them, I would be totally lost because, you know, not only do we have, you know, their other daily needs like diaper changing, feeding tubes, things like that, that we have to take care of. We have to get education done. So, you know, we work together, we plan, you know, who's going to work with who, what day, what level of assistance they need. Some of my students need more verbal prompts. Some need more visual prompts. I have some that need hand over hand um, instruction. So, you know, you, we kind of do that and make sure we, we're working with what students and we have a schedule where we stick to. We have assignments, we have color coded days, you know, that we work with and collect data on each one of those days to ensure that we're monitoring and adjust, adjusting the level of instruction for each student to make sure that they reach mastery or get close to mastering each goal and objective. Yeah, so the, the idea of having help in your classroom uh, it sounds like a, a great benefit. <laughs> yeah. how, how do you get on the same page with them? Is it kind of uh, organic or do you have sit down meetings? Tell me about your relationship oh. with your paras. Well, luckily, I've had the uh, same two paraprofessionals for the past five years. Once wow. I moved over to the Life Skills classroom, uh, they've been with me from the get go. And so we've kind of developed what's almost like a family relationship. And, you know, with my students, they need that same structure, that same routine every single day. They know what to expect when they come to class. So me and my professionals, we just kind of get into a routine and we know what to do, what's going to happen. You know, for the most part, maybe that first couple of weeks with a new student, we have to kind of fill them out. But once we get into a routine, it kind of just go, we just go with the flow and everything works out pretty good most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it sounds like, uh, even amidst some of the challenges in your classroom, Mesquite and, and your jobs really set you up in, in a lot of ways to be successful as a teacher. Right, exactly. So tell me more about, um, I'm, as I'm just thinking here, listening to some of the things you've dropped in terms of what you have to deal with in a classroom. Yeah. You seem like a pretty jovial person, uh, but how do you <laughs> um, manage the emotional energy that it's, it takes to go in and, and, and interact with these kids every day? I mean, it's, it's very stressful at some point in time throughout the day. You know, you have, to, you have to sit back sometimes and remind yourself that these students are learning how to interact with people and, and process information. They process information differently than, you know, and you, you have to, you can't take anything they say or do to you seriously mm. or you'll, 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 you won't last very long. It just, it just yeah. it's honest. You know, when you have students spitting, flipping desks, throwing chairs, I mean, you just have to take a chill pill, worry about the other kids safety and their education and just do what's best in the situation, the best that you can. And just, you can't take it serious. You, you have to just basically just go with the flow and to be in special ed. I think the number one thing you have to have is patience. I mean, without patience, you're not going to last very long. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 I've never taught a special ed class. I'm, I'm uh, certified in, in math and now I, I work in a, in a, a desk here, but I, I do uh, certainly appreciate the special ed teachers. And the more I've gotten to talk to, to you and others during, during the series of I teach live, it's certainly become apparent that special ed teachers are just that they're special. Uh, it takes a, a big heart and a disposition uh, to love on those kids really well, because as much as you have patience, that patience is, is driven by a care for those kids and, and a love for mm -hmm. those kids. Right. Because right. uh, you want to see them be successful. Mm -hmm. Do you see your kids year over year, or do they leave you after the end of the first year? Or uh, de 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 depending, for the most part, as long as you know the numbers and the. Uh, the, the zoning for our school is correct. I usually have the students from the time that they get into first grade typically until they go to sixth grade, unless they move or numbers fluctuate, but I have them for a long period of time. 
Well, that's got to be helpful. You have you have okay. kids for more than one year. You have help and paraprofessionals. You can really cultivate uh, what you're talking about a family relationship because you, right. you know them and you have them for so long. Uh, what a great benefit to the students as well mm -hmm. that they're not having changing teachers and changing faces. Right. They know coming into the class that there's family and there's a familiar face every day. And that's the most important thing for, for our students is to have that routine, that structure. I mean, right when they walk through the door, they hear my voice. Morning work, Vizzle is Vizzle's our special education curriculum, and then notebook work, and they know, oh, okay, it's, it's morning work. We know, whatever. But, I mean, it's just that they know what to expect every single day. <laughs> so I want to talk about, I mean, you have unique challenges, like every teacher in your, in your own classroom, and you highlighted some of them that are needed. But now, fast forward to right where we're at now, where we're in a global pandemic, schools shut down, and now you're, you're having to interact with special education needs remotely. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that experience. It was, uh, it was a whirlwind, to put it shortly. So right whenever it happened, I tried to get a game plan going that what would be, with all the stresses going on with these families right now, you don't know if these families, um, you know, if they're still working, they're out of a source of income. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what will be less stressful and try to get some education going. And so, like I said briefly, that uh, in Mesquite, our special education curriculum that we've used a lot is Vizzle. Um, it's just like a computer-based game where I can assign assignments, you know, and lessons. And so I was like, okay, that's going to be our main focus at first, is I'm going to go in, assign them more lessons where I can track their data. I sent the parents home that information. Because I can daily track, you know, what percentages they're hitting on, what lessons they're doing, how many they're doing, how much they're playing them. And then, you know, and then I slowly started to introduce uh, Google Classroom, you know, video with my students. And, you know, because for them, it's kind of, it's hard for them to interact over, you know, the video. Right. And so, but I slowly wanted to introduce that to see just possibly if this would be an option if we have to go out in the future again. Yeah, you're, you're right. And it's, it's good to have that forward thinking vision about let's just set up things that if we need to come back to them at a later date, for whatever reason, you can you can implement those and kind of turn that that uh, switch back on. Right. I have a question uh, kind of embedded in your answer just now, but I want to let people know that are watching on the Facebook right now. We're here with Matthew. He is a special ed teacher in North Texas. If you have questions for him, drop a comment. We'll try to ask him on the fly uh, any questions you have about uh, his experience as a teacher. You mentioned, uh, well, not you, not you mentioned, but kind of embedded in your, your response uh, is technology at home. It made me think mm -hmm. about your relationship with the parents because now parents are, are much more forward in, in the, the formal education piece of their kids. How has that been with, with just parent relationships and then moving to technology, needing the parents' help with that? Yeah, um, like I said earlier, and we talked about, you know, I had a lot of my students for multiple years. So you develop a pretty close relationship with, with the parents. Um, and so I either communicate with them via email or I also use what's known as the Remind app on the phone to message them daily. You know, at first thing in the morning, I'll check their, their scores from their visual scores. I'll message the parents how they did that day before. And the biggest thing was with the parents. I just wanted to let them know that I was here to support them in any way possible they needed, you know, email, remind, just let me know what you need. I, I would help you. Um, I did uh, basically a spreadsheet uh, of uh, all the videos we watched in class, you know, of, during our calendar song time, our skip kind of song videos, kind of so the kids could watch those at home to kind of feel like they're still kind of getting their education in a different yeah. format. I, I broke down all of their, their IEP goals and objectives and wrote those down for the parents and told them like, if you have extra time, just kind of work on these a little bit during your free time. You know, I didn't want the parents to stress too much because it's already a stressful thing we're dealing with now. And I feel like if we stressed them out too much, then they would pull back how much they're working on sure. with the students. Yeah, there's, there's a balance. And obviously, we, you and I, we're trying to be sensitive to what we don't know about what other people are going through. Like you mentioned, you don't know if parents have lost incomes or, or anything like that. So being sensitive to that is really, I think, hopefully appreciated. The, and the idea of providing familiarity with them so that they can see something at home that they've seen in the classroom 
that's right. a great idea just to give them kind of a base. Like this mm -hmm. isn't all foreign. There is some normal things that can still occur. Although it's just a little bit different with Mr. Matt not leading the class in front of them. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, exactly. they, they can still see things that maybe they have that, that trigger of recognition. How, how well have your parents um, been responding and, and uh, active? You, you give them, it sounds like a lot of resources to, to help out the spreadsheet and, and the different um, resources you, you kind of listed off there. Have they been well to step into that and find that balance? Oh yeah, a lot of my parents stepped up big time and I made sure that they know how much I appreciate what they're doing and how much they're helping their students. Um, they, they've been, most of my students have been logging in to, to Vizzle the, uh, daily, completing lessons, some up to 30 a day, which was what my minimum requirement in class before they could earn any choice or free time. They had to do 30 Vizzle lessons a day. Um, they have also, a lot of them, we provided extra uh, work packets to continue working on with them, like with uh, their handwriting skills um, and other things that they, they work on in class. But yeah, my parents have stepped up, you know, a lot with working with their students. And it, it, the data doesn't lie. It shows that they have. <laughs> I mean, that's great. We, we know just anecdotally that when there's a supportive team around any student, special ed or general ed, when you have a a teacher, a parent, and then the administration fully on board for the kids' education, it's meaningful. And it's cool that you have data to support that. Yeah. Um, because we know it to be true. We, we know fundamentally that when the student goes home and, and their parent is engaged about what they learned that right. day, uh, yeah. it's, it's helpful. And we've yeah. talked consistently um, over, over several um, weeks now about setting high expectations for kids and then letting them know you're going to be there to help them achieve those high expectations. So, man, kudos to you uh, for creating the relationships that now kind of pay off in a big way right. during a pandemic. I think yes. teachers, unfortunately, don't have those type of relationships with the parents are, are probably struggling a little bit more and facing challenges uh, that um, that might not be there. Not, not to say that we can anticipate another pandemic, but it does yeah. show the value of having the entire team on board administrators, teachers, parents, regardless of what gets thrown at us, we can collectively respond, right? Right. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so I have one more question than we actually had someone uh, ask on Facebook. I want to ask that question as well. But okay. one question I had is, is how are you doing with this? You're, you're now a teacher at home. Uh, and, and do you have a wife at home or, or family at home? It looks like you have a daughter. I've seen her. Oh, pop yeah. Up. Yeah. She, How's she, that was been? Supposed, she was supposed to be an eye station. You know how they get kind of distracted. Uh, <laughs> man, uh, I am very thankful that uh, because I have three daughters, seven, uh, seven, three, and one. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. So, and luckily, both my in laws are uh, retired and they live close. So, I'm able to kind of drive over to their house and they help me watch the girls while I get some work done because my wife has always worked from home and she's constantly on the phone. So they're, I, while I'm trying to teach and do lessons, I can't keep them from running to the door and banging on it and say, mommy, yeah, mommy, yeah. mommy. Cause <laughs> during, the, during the summer, that's what I feel like I do. I'm dealing with one, one tries to escape and go bother mommy. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, tell my wife i have got to get some work done i can't sit here and just watch the girls all day so that's yeah. i'm very blessed that i have you know my in-laws to help me watch them so i can get some work done <laughs> uh well matt you're not not encouraging me i have a, my my third one is due in august and i'm, I'm uh i'm anxious <laughs> about having uh three running around <laughs> oh man yeah it's it's an adventure you know <laughs> So, uh, like I said, someone in Facebook hopped in. I'm just going to read verbatim her question. We okay. can figure out uh, exactly how to answer it. It says, is it better on students with a personal aid for their aid to stay with them year to year? What about when they change schools? What would you recommend a personal aid do concerning this? In, um, now, my students, none of them have a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional. But in my opinion, I am not a big fan of one-on-one -on -one uh, paraprofessionals because I think the student gets too used to having that person. What happens if they're sick? What happens if they go to work for two days? So we rotate daily and work with each student at least once. I work one student for a little bit. One of my parents works with that student for another bit and the other one. So I think it's better. Now my students need that one-on-one -on -one help, but it's better that everyone takes turns because you can't guarantee that that person is going to be there every day to work with that student. Yeah. I thought about that when you were talking about the family and how they know when they walk in the class, your voice says, 
uh, yeah. you know, that you greet them. And I was thinking, man, what happens if you are out one day, but it sounds like you've have a system in place, right? Where they're kind of used to that change. Mm -hmm. and, and to it looks like Jamie asked that question to Jamie's question, by kind of embedding in that change process, if they were to change schools or lose uh, an aid or transition to another aid, there will be less hopefully of, of a, a change to them uh, because it's already, they already know of other people would come and help. Right, exactly. So uh, just a reminder, uh, I wanna ensure anyone who has a question on Facebook, go ahead and ask. Uh, and we're gonna wrap up uh, pretty soon. But uh, Matt, one of the, the final questions I've been asking most people at the end of this is, is just, what's your advice going to a first year teacher? We have a lot of individuals thinking about the teaching profession, yeah. maybe on the fence. What would be your first advice to them or your best advice when they're thinking about getting into the teaching and then as they enter in the school year that first time? I, I mean, like I said earlier, the biggest thing was to be finding a good mentor teacher to lean on, but also it's you've got to find a happy work life balance. I mean, I see some teachers working all hours. And it's not to say that it's you've got to take some time for yourself and time for your family. Because if you try to work all hours of the night to lesson plan, to uh, you're, you're going to get burned out. Your goal isn't to get burned out. Your goal is to be a teacher for the long haul. You've got to just sit back and find, okay, what do I need to get done today? And what can be put off until tomorrow? Because if you don't find that happy work-life balance, you're not going to be happy in teaching. Yeah, and, and kind of to your point, I, I totally appreciate that perspective. And what I've been hearing over the last half hour talking to you is how awesome it is for your students to have a support system. But it sounds like you have a great support system too yeah. to help kind of recharge you. You have your daughters and your wife and your in-laws. You have your yeah. paras. I mean, you, you have a lot of uh, resources that you're taking full advantage of probably in large part to keep that balance so you're not exhausted because – it's better for a teacher to pour out all their energy in that classroom, but have that energy to pour out in the classroom to begin with. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> so I want to, I'm looking through some of these comments here. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, Jamie's joining us. She's uh, asking about autistic students. Let me see what she says here. So I think just a follow up uh, from from Jamie, she's she's asking if if an autistic student who's had a personal aid since they started school, um, you would still recommend that they look to maybe change year over year or if they've had a, an aid, you know, so far so they continue that. If, if this, I mean, not expert on this, but if my opinion would be if they've had a personal aid to kind of slowly introduce other people, you know, to working with that student, because as they transition throughout their education, as their life, they're not going to have a personal aid with them 24, you know, yeah. for every hour of the day. So, it, and I'm not saying just yank that person away that they're familiar with right off the bat, but I'm saying like, let's, you know, maybe have someone else work with them for 30 minutes a day and then a week later, an hour a day and slowly build and get them used to interacting with other people because a lot of our special needs kids need that practice socializing and interacting. You're not going to socialize and interact, interact with the same person every day. Your goal is to interact with multiple people throughout the day. Yeah. And I think the larger context, Matt, if I can expand on that, <clears throat> our goal for any student, special ed, general ed, is yeah. to prepare them for life. Exactly. Uh, and so as much as um, paras and aides, they play a crucial role in our education system and in your class specifically, we still want to keep on pushing those students further and push their bounds, raise their expectations. And, and we don't want to ever shock the system, but right. by not having an aid year over year consistently in there, you actually do well to not shock the system, to, to invite others into that educational uh, life. So I, I completely agree um, with that. Matt, I know we asked for 30 minutes of your time today, and I, I certainly appreciate you, you giving that to us. I, I am hopeful that your, your family is safe, and, and I know North Texas is starting to reopen, so hopefully normal is around the corner. 
Uh, I feel I feel it's getting close. We're not there yet, but I'm hey, just gotta hold on to that hope, you know. <laughs> well, I'm I'm uh, personally excited that maybe uh, sports. I feel like when sports come back, it'll feel a little bit nor- more normal for me on my uh, end. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm a diehard Dallas Cowboys fan, so uh, I'm hoping for a, a good season this year, and so we'll see. Hopefully, it comes back, you know. <laughs> Well, let's let's all hope for a normal uh, fall with sports, but also obviously education. Let's get those kids back in the classroom and uh, start uh, continuing to teach them more traditionally. I think, uh, in my personal opinion, I think they need teachers in front of them uh, in that classroom. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know uh, speaking for myself, I do miss the personal interaction, the joking, the laughing with the students. Yeah. So I think we're all hoping that we get back to, to that soon. Well, Matt, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us and, and be well. Enjoy your summer. Thank you. You too.